Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Oak Cliff. We're so glad you've joined us today. One quick announcement. Until further notice, either through our Facebook or our website, all church activities are canceled. Susan's coming now to lead us in worship. <laughs>
to be able to record this uh, service, be able to worship in this way. I just pray and thank you for your 
guidance and leadership on a daily basis. I want to thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and the ultimate gift you gave to us. I pray that as you continue to work in our hearts, being that faithful and cheerful giver that you meant us to be, to be able to worship in this way, giving back to what is rightfully yours. So take back these gifts, these offerings, and these tithes to further the kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
And we encourage you just to keep your trust. Trust in the Lord. And this is a recorded uh, service here today. And it would more than likely be the same on next week. But I pray that you would be uh, touched by this. Let me add this, if I may. If you are blessed by this message, you know you can go on the tab and uh, give your tithe or give a donation if you choose to. If you are blessed by this message so that we can continue to do uh, what we do for the Lord. Let me pray. Father God, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we, we love you. We glorify you. God, we honor you. And Lord, I pray for those who will be listening today. Those who will be listening at another time. Lord God, that you would use this message to glorify yourself. Use this message, Lord God, to stir up hearts. Remind your people that you are still God. And God, I pray that those who do not belong to you, that their hearts will be stirred to want to belong to you so that they know that they are under the protection of God Almighty. God, have your way right now. Move me out of the way, Lord, and, and you have your perfect way. Again, Lord God, we love you. We praise you. We honor you. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. With the coronavirus pandemic, there is a fear finding its way in the hearts of the people across the globe, and many believers are included. With the coronavirus pandemic, there is fear of finding its way in the hearts of people across the globe, and many believers are included. I can understand that fear sets in in not knowing the unknown of a pandemic. The world isn't prepared for anything like this. Did you know that the phrase slash command, do not fear, do not be afraid, is the most quoted statement in the Bible? Over and over and over, God says, do not be afraid, do not fear. Again, it is the most stated in the Bible. It's true. Although there is a statement made in reference that we ought to fear. And this morning, or whatever time you are watching this, we will venture into a passage of Scripture where God says to fear. The title of this message is Fear of the Holy One. And we're coming from Matthew 10, 26. Through 33. And by the way, you can go on the website and download the outline. There will be an outline there, and uh, you'll be able to have access to that outline, and you can put your, your own notes and your own uh, points that are coming from this uh, passage of Scripture. So we'll be reading from Matthew, and it reads as thus. So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will be that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. This is Jesus speaking, by the way. And what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both body and and so in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are more, you are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. The colonists and landers who has passed away some years ago is said to have received 
an average of 10,000 letters each month. And nearly all of them were from people overwhelmed with problems. She was asked if there was any one of them which predominates throughout the letters she received. And her reply was, about all of the subjects that people were writing in about, the number one was fear. Fear. People are afraid of losing their health, their wealth, their loved ones. And people are just afraid of life in itself. I can understand that when God is not in your life. If you're living a life outside of God, and if God is not your God, I don't mean as just knowing his existence. I mean having a personal relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ. That means that you recognize Jesus as your Savior and as your Lord. Then there is no fear. There's no reason to fear. Because God Almighty has his hands on you. Number one, do not be afraid of what man can do. Now I want you to note something here. Look at who Jesus is speaking to. He's speaking to his disciples. So he's speaking to believers, first century. So he says in verse 26, so have no fear of them. Well, who's them? In order to find out who the them is, and to keep this within its context, you want to go to the verse that precedes this, and to the passages that are before this are, Jesus is talking about persecution will come. In fact, they'll come from religious leaders. He also says, a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master, him being the master. He goes on to say that if they call me the prince of Beelzebub, in other words, how much more would they do to you or want to do to you? So that's the them that Jesus is speaking of. So again, it says, so have no fear of them, those I just mentioned. For nothing is co covered that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. This word here, have no fear. What that means in the Greek is to have no fear at no time, given the law to Christ. And have no fear now and have no fear in the future. Have no fear, period, of what mere man can do. And everything that they do, everything that they've done, their motivation of the heart at one day, at one time, will be revealed. Anything that's hidden will be known. Verse 27 says, What I tell you in the dark, Jesus speaking again, Say in the light. And when you hear whisper, proclaim on the housetop. Now, what is this? Jesus was obviously speaking to them at times where there was no one else around. Many times it was in the dark, in a seclusion of night, when nobody else was around except him and them, the disciples. He also whispers, it's, it's, a, it's a metaphor of keeping things secret, keeping things down uh, as a hush on the down low, 21st century. In other words, they didn't want, he didn't want, Jesus didn't want the disciples to go out and tell everybody, at least not John. That was his message. He, he was teaching the disciples, but now he says, what I tell you in the dark, say in the light. Now, these are commands. These are imperatives. And what you hear whispered, or what you have heard that was whispered, proclaim on the housetop. And he's saying, make it known. Make what known? Proclaim what? You remember, you recall, Jesus continually 
warned the disciples there will come a day where he would be crucified. And on that third day, he resurrected for the sins of the world. Although they didn't understand all that at that time, and neither did they understand what was coming. Because if you were to continue to read from 34, you see Jesus says, I didn't come to bring peace, but I came to bring a sword, mother against a daughter, father against son, etc., etc. So he's warning them about things to come, things that would take place for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of Jesus' name. Now that tells us today, it tells them and them as well, that just because you belong to God, just because we're Christians, it does not mean that we are exempt from anything that goes on in this world. As you can see today, based on what we're going through as a global, it's a global pandemic. And I guarantee you that some of the people who are affected are believers in Jesus Christ. So it does not mean that we are exempt, but what it does mean is that we don't have to worry about that. We don't have to fear. Why? Because our lives and their lives in the first century were in the hands of God Almighty. Now what he's telling them, Jesus, is to go, go proclaim this on the housetops. And in other words, on the highest pinnacle, if you will, Shout it out to the people that Jesus Christ at that time is here. Not for you and I. We want to shout out, we want to proclaim the gospel. The same gospel that Jesus taught in the first century. Now he's telling them, go. And he's telling you and I to go. Go tell it. In fact, people need to hear about the love of God, especially at a time as this. So believers, I'm speaking to believers here. Believers, this is an opportunity for you to shout on the rooftop, not literally, but figuratively. Tell people, share with your neighbors, share with people across the street, your co-workers, those that you have, those that are working from home, those that are communicating with their co-workers via technology. Let them know about God. Tell them how much God loves them. Tell them how much God wants a relationship with them. But it has to be through His Son. Jesus Christ is the bridge that brings people to God the Father. But as a believer, you and I, it is our God-given responsibility to proclaim the gospel, to tell people about Jesus Christ. And I'm not saying just tell them that everything's going to be okay, although that's a good thing. But tell them what God has done for them. I mean, that is the gospel. The gospel is Jesus Christ being born of a virgin, being crucified for our sins, being buried, and on that third day, resurrecting, defeating sin, defeating death, defeating the grave. And because he lives, we too and they too shall live. This is the gospel. This is the time where we need to be sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And notice what Jesus is not telling them to do. He's not telling them Stay in your homes when these threats of persecution come. He's not saying that. But what is he saying? What I told you in the dark, say in the light. Again, command. And what you hear whisper, proclaim, command. Proclaim on the housetops. He's not telling them to be quiet, to be hushed hush, to keep it on the down road. Instead, outreach, reaching out for people, to people rather, being the hands and feet of Jesus. The message still speaks today that God is able. Second Timothy 1, 7 says, For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, 
but of power and love and a sound mind. What is that spirit? That is his spirit. He has given us his Holy Spirit. Whereas we don't have to fear. We don't have to fear of any pandemic, any epidemic. We don't have to fear of persecutors, as he's telling the disciples here. You don't have to fear of these religious leaders who, who want to persecute you. Don't fear. And you might be asking, well, what does this all mean to me today? Don't fear. Don't be afraid of what mere man can do. Number two. Instead of fear of the Holy One, God is the only one worthy to be feared. He is the only one worthy of that position. He is the only one worthy of our reverence. It tells us here in 28, Jesus tells speaking, And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Hello. Here's another commandment, another imperative, but it's a negative imperative. Do not fear. Again, this means do not fear today nor at any future time. You do not have to fear. You do not have to be afraid. Again, speaking to the disciples for a century, but God's word speaks today. And he's speaking to you and to I. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. What is he saying? He's saying is that the only thing that man can do to you is kill the body. Given they kill the body for a believer, what happens? We go into glory. We go into the presence of God. Is it that bad? No, it's not. In fact, there's no other way to enter into eternity except through death or given the Lord comes for his people. But this is what he's saying is to his disciples, don't worry about mere men. Don't worry about what they can do because the worst that they can do is kill you. Now, for an unbeliever, for someone who doesn't trust in God, who doesn't trust that their eternity is secure in God, is that something to fear? You got it. Because I have no idea where I'm going. I don't want to be cast into hell, as we'll see here in a minute. God, what he's saying, he has the power to do both. If you, if you have your Bibles out, I want you to circle the word soul. Because what he's pointing out here is that the soul is far more important than the body. Because the soul lasts for eternity. The body's only here for a short time. In other words, we only live here on earth for a short time. James says that life is as a vapor. Here today and gone tomorrow. A vapor is mist or smoke coming out of your mouth from the cold air. You see the smoke and you see it no more. And he says that this is life. Here today, gone tomorrow. But Jesus is pointing out that the soul is far greater than the body. Again, this is the most that people can do. Now, in the first century, there was many who lived lives anti-cross, who lived lives anti-disciples, anti the kingdom of God. And this is why they were dealing with persecution. More then probably than today, although it's, it's coming at a faster rate now, in the 21st century than it has ever. But back then, because this was the beginning of what we would call the movement, the Christian movement, 
much persecution. And here is where Jesus says to fear. Now, we would have never thought that God would say to fear something, but he is. He says, instead of fearing what mere man can do, God speaking, how about fearing me? He says, rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. You see, God has the power to do both. Mere man does not. Mere man has the power to kill the body, to snuff your life. But God has the power to snuff your life and send you to hell. Totally separated from him for all eternity. Now the word hell, he's using this as a metaphor. In the Greek, it's Gehenna. Gehenna was the place where they had a burning fire that continued to burn and burn and burn. That's where they burned their trash. And that's where they burned dead animals. Anything that was uh, of, of disposing, they threw there. And the fire never went out. And this is a metaphor for hell because Jesus later uses the phrase that it is a fire that is never quenched. The fire never is put out. And he's referring to his power. He has power to do both kill the body and then both sell the body and send it to hell. 29 says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And of course, it's a rhetorical question because they understood this. During their time, they understood that sparrows were sold for a penny. They understood that sparrows were sold for a cheap price. In fact, sparrows were by far the cheapest food considered food for the poor when people didn't have the money. And the penny was the smallest coin in the Roman world. And it was worth only one sixteenth of a denarius. So less than one hour's worth of work. That is very, very inexpensive. Very cheap. But listen to what Jesus says. He says, and not one of them, the sparrows, will fall to the ground apart from your father. Meaning God knows. Every time a sparrow falls, every time a sparrow is killed for eating, didn't catch God by surprise. So if God had this knowledge of sparrows, the, the cheapest, the, the lowest cost to feed the poor, you can best, best believe he knows what's going on in our lives, in our individual lives as well as our world today. In verse 30 said, but even the hairs of your head are all numbered. God alone is worthy to be feared. In fact, he's the only one who is worthy. So Jesus uses an argument to contrast the lesser from the greater, the less important food source, and the greater humanity, which is the apex of God's creation. Man, you and I are made after the image of God. That makes you important. And God registers and cares for the smallest sparrow. And how much more does he care for you? How much more does he care for me? And Jesus also shows the smallest part of the human body is the hair. Innumerable yeah, or lack of. But yet, it's controlled and known by God. I mean, we wouldn't even consider God knows every number of hairs or lack of that I have on my head. Yes. He's sovereign. 
omniscient, all-knowing. He knows it all. And the theme is God's providence, his loving providence over his people. He knows and watches every detail of our lives. And our folks here at Calvary uh, hear this quite often from me because I, I emphasize this over and over and over. And it is this. That if you belong to the Lord, through Jesus Christ, if you belong to God, every second of your life is in His hands. There is nothing that happens to you or anything that concerns you that is outside of Him knowing, outside of His will. And many times we don't understand it. But God knows what he's doing. He's sovereign. He is sovereign. So, again, believers, Christians, we're not exempt from things that go on around the world. Yes, God keeps us. Yes, God protects us. And many times that this pandemic, for us, me speaking out, I know that I don't have it, or at least I think I don't have it. I believe that God can keep me from it. But if he doesn't, that changes nothing. That changes nothing about God. That changes nothing about my faith in God. Because I know that this life here is only for a moment. And it's far better and greater where we are going. So if God is sovereign, and he is, if God is in control over history, and he is, and he has been, he has every detail of your life in his hands. You don't have to fear. There's no need to fear. Ever. To a believer. Ever. Now, is that hard at times? For some, yes, it's hard. Many believers today are probably in fear. But God's word is saying to us today, don't fear, but rather fear him. Look to him, whatever the situation is, a pandemic, World War III, whatever. We are commanded, understand, this is a command. It's not an option. Hey guys, do you feel like not fearing today? No. He says, do not Fear. And again, that means ever. Do not fear ever. Now, do God want non-believers to fear him? Yes. A million times over, yes. So if you are watching this video and you have never placed your trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord, God wants a relationship with you. You are never created to live a life outside of God. Never. But the only way that you can have this relationship with him is through his son. Acknowledging that Jesus Christ paid the debt of your sins. That he has bought you brought back from the slavery of sin. That he has trans transferred you over from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Man, this is big. This ought to blow your mind. And it will change your life. Not only your eternal destiny, but it will change your life in the now. You'll never look back and regret that you received Christ as Savior and Lord. Yeah. But you'll always be thankful. Listen to what God's Word says in Psalms 33 and 8. That all the earth fear the Lord. See, now he's telling us to fear. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Hello. He is the only one worthy of this fear, of this reverence, of this high respect. You know, I was thinking this past week, why all this is going on? Why? Why now? 
Why in our generation? I can't give you the answer to that. But what came to my mind is, maybe God is using this in a way that he's cracking open the sky, figuratively, sticking out his head, figuratively, and saying, people, I am God, and you are not. Because people, we are inclined to think that we're in control of ourselves and of everything else. And God is reminding us, in fact, you are not in control. He is. Isn't that something to really ponder about? God saying, folks, guys, women, ladies, children, I am God. And you are not. Psalms 38, 18 says, Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. Listen to that if you're not a believer. If you've never put your trust in what God has done for you at the cross. Listen to this again in light of that. Behold, or listen up, the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him that means you recognize that he's God. And not only recognizing that he's God, but it translates into your life. And the only way that that happens, again, is through and in the cross. It says on those who hope in his steadfast love. Well, what does this mean for me, you might ask? The application would be rest in the Lord. You don't have to be stressed because you can be blessed. You don't have to think, let your mind run away with what if. Relax. Trust. Trust God. Give you belong to Him. Rest in the Lord. That's one of the beauties of us having this relationship with God. We don't have to worry. We don't have to fear. I'm not telling you don't be concerned about certain things or don't take precautions. Of course, you want to be wise. You want to be smart. But you don't have to fear where it brings in uh, the fact that you're afraid. Hey, we know where we're going. Number three, do not be afraid because you are valuable to God. You are valuable. Therefore, God is watching over you. It says in 31, here we go, I have another negative commandment. Fear not. Did you know fear in the Greek? Fall. Fall. It sounds like what word from the English? Phobic. Fear. That's where we get our word from. There's many different types of folder. But he says, fear not, or don't be afraid. Therefore, you are more valued, you are of more value than many sparrows. For because of everything that you just heard, everything that you just read, therefore, you don't have to fear. Therefore, you don't have to be afraid. Why? Because if God knows when the sparrows drop dead, God knows what's going on in your life. And by the way, you are more valuable. Speaking to the disciples and speaking to you and I, you are more of value than the sparrows. In fact, he says, many sparrows. Alone, many sparrows. 32. So everyone, including the unbeliever, Yes, believer and unbeliever. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, Jesus is saying, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. So acknowledging Jesus in the first century was living for him, was 
was proclaiming the gospel at whatever season of life it was. And it was not to fear. We acknowledge God. I tell you, if you belong to God, or since you belong to God, you know what I'm saying here. I mean, I'm believers, you won't get this, so don't try to figure it out. But if you are a believer, you know that, hey, you can't keep this in. You can't keep this to yourself. You want to tell somebody about Jesus. You want to tell somebody about what God has done for you, man. Blows my mind that God wiped my slate clean. I mean, this is something you cannot be quiet about. And you want to share. And that is a, a, a literal way of acknowledging him. And he says, when you acknowledge me, I will acknowledge you before my Father who was in heaven. Man, isn't that something? That Jesus would tell God the Father, this one is ours. He or she belongs to us. Imagine that's you they're talking about. And if it's you, the unbeliever, you know that can change. He also says, but whoever denies me before men, here's the negative side. Whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. There is absolutely nobody who would like to stand in a position such as this. That based on my life, based on the life that I live, now I'm standing before God and I never acknowledge Jesus Christ in my entire life. And here I am standing to give an account to God. And my advocate, my would-be redeemer, because I've never received him, that's would-be. He comes and says, oh, this one. I don't acknowledge him. I don't acknowledge her. They denied me before men. I deny you. And some of the words that might be used would be, depart from me. You who live in sin. You who refuse to receive what God has done for you through Jesus Christ. You who live in iniquity, same word would be sin. And that is denying Jesus Christ by continuing to live in that way and suppressing the truth, ignoring the truth, never responding to the truth, at least in a positive way. This ought to be the time. Then, they're in the persecution days in the first century, and this ought to be the time now in the 21st century where a bold proclamation is being heralded. This shouldn't be a time when we're just sitting on our hands doing nothing. I mean, there's all kinds of things that you can be doing. Yes, we are limited and restricted to go here and there, but we can pray. During this time, man, you can become a prayer warrior. Maybe you're not used to praying on your knees and your face every day. Well, now you don't have anywhere to rush off to. I'm not praying. And maybe what God will do is develop this habit and you make it habitual that you spend time with God on your face every day. Maybe you haven't been in the Word. Maybe you've been mediocre. Maybe to God wants to use this time to get you into His Word so that you see what you are missing. Taste and see that he is good. The psalmist says, sweeter, 
sweeter than honey. Proverbs 9 and 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is insight. John 14, 27, Jesus speaking to the disciples as he's getting ready to go to Jerusalem to be crucified. He says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give. Let not your heart be troubled, and neither let it be afraid. Mm -hmm. Now how does it speak to us? Know that God loves you. That you are of value to Him. And that He will care for you given that you belong to him. Matthew Henry, the famous scholar, was once robbed by thieves. And this is what he wrote in his journal. He said, let me be thankful first, because I was never robbed before. Second, although they took my wallet, they did not take my life. Third, although they took everything I had, it was not much. And fourth, because it was I who was robbed and not I who robbed. He had plenty to be thankful for. Most of us wouldn't see that as you go through a robbery. Perhaps God is using his time to say to you, hey people, I am robbed. Maybe God is drawing you unto himself. And he's saying to you, you are not in control like you thought you were. God is calling you to surrender. God does use circumstances to draw us onto himself. As Susan makes her way up here, I want you to contemplate on what you've heard. Because God now will want a response. with and it made contact with his flesh. 
It was Rick Elkin. But he did that for you. He did that for me. He was slapped. He was spit upon. His beard was yanked. He was made fun of. They took a crown of thorns and pressed it on his brow, on his head. And they forced him to carry a wooden cross. Some say that it would weigh up to 150 pounds over his bare back. He had to carry his own cross until he couldn't do it any longer. Do you think that was enough? He was nailed to this stake, hands and feet. And then he was put in a hole on Calvary for all to see. Put on display for all to see. And there he died. There sin was paid for. Your sin and mine. But it doesn't happen automatically. You have to receive this for yourself. And God is calling us today this, this not only to believe, but to receive. Make him yours. Let this be personal between you and him. Three days later, he was resurrected. Proven that he was God. There he defeated sin, which is what we call Easter. There he defeated the grave, defeated death. He defeated the enemy. And he lives, sits at the right hand of God the Father. And by his spirit lives within us. But he did that for the world. So if you sit today, if you do not have Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, and you want that, you would just pray simple but profound prayer. And it would be along these lines. God, I'm sorry. I recognize that I'm a sinner. I recognize that I live in sin. I'm asking you to forgive me for my sins. I'm choosing to turn from my sins and turn to you. I believe that Jesus Christ was indeed born of a virgin, set by you. I believe that he lived a sinless life, that he was crucified for my sins. I believe that on that third day he rose from the dead, defeating sin. I believe that right now he's alive, sitting at your right hand. And God, I'm asking you to receive me as your son or as your daughter. And if you do that, if you've done that, you are a follower. You are a child of God. If you have done that genuinely, it's not the end. It's just the beginning. And what you want to do is you want to continue to seek God. In other words, pray. Find a believer, find a Christian who might help you walk this Christian walk. You can look at our website and you'll have our contact information there. If you need to contact us regarding this or anything else, contact us. There's a tab on there that says prayer request. You can put anything in there, we'll receive it, and it stays confidential. And if you need something for us to send you, where you can grow as a believer, we'll do that. Remember, do not be afraid. Do not fear. God bless you.